Greetings and welcome back to the John Audio Tech Show. Today on the bench, I'm going to play around with a stereo op amp circuit here, dual channel, any 5532. I'm going to make a power supply for it. I'm going to start with a very basic supply, very poor performance, and see what it sounds like. I'll hook it up here and record some music being played through the circuit. See if you can really tell a difference or not. Then I will improve on the power supply. We'll take a look on the scope here to see how it improves and take it from there. Okay, so this is what we'll start with. This is a dual rail supply. If you notice here, this only has one diode on the positive side and one on the negative side, so it's half wave. So when the waveform is in the bottom half and this top is turned off, this capacitor will have to supply the current to the amplifier for the whole time. And the converse is true here. When the waveform is positive, this diode will not be conducting, and this capacitor has to supply the negative rail. So yeah, it's basic as you can get it. So I dug around through my uh, parts here. I found this small transformer and I set a simple supply up. I want to start out with very small value capacitors. Being half wave, you want to make sure you have a large enough value. But we're only going to use 100 microfarad. Of course, being an op amp, it's not going to require a lot of current. The NE5532 that I'm going to use only needs about 8 milliamps of quiescent current plus the output current. And since the output's, you know, driving a fairly high impedance, that's pretty negligible. Okay, got the meter in the shot. Hopefully you can see that all right. So we'll measure from the ground or common point to the uh, negative rail. Negative 12.3. And to the positive rail, we get 12.3. And across the rails, we'll get 24.6, I bet. Nope, 24 point, yeah, about 0.7 or so. Good enough. Okay, so let's apply power. And it popped up to, we're 5 volts per division, so 5, 10, and a little bit more so around 12 volts but you notice we have a perfectly flat line the reason for that is well there's no load presently on the power supply so there's nothing to draw current off the capacitor so it stays charged kind of like a battery that you're not using so let's put a load and I'll put a small load this one I don't know if you can see that. 1K resistor. That'll approximately equal the draw from the op amp. Okay, so now you can see the ripple. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to AC couple this so it's not offset like that. There we go. So now it's AC coupled. I can turn that up. So you see what's happening here. It's quickly charging up. When the uh, waveform goes positive, it forward biases the diode and charges up to the peak value. And when it turns off, it slowly discharges the capacitor through a time constant that can be calculated given the capacitor's value and the load resistor. Now to show you that it's half wave, I'll take out the capacitor and you see that we get the half wave. So instead of full wave rectification, we get half wave. So there's so much dead time here, the capacitor will discharge quite a bit. So we're getting uh, about two volts of ripple there, pretty ugly really. And if we had full wave rectification, we'd have a pulse right in the middle here that would charge this up. So this wouldn't discharge nearly as much 
using a full wave. So we have a pretty lousy supply, really. But I'm curious of how the op amp will perform with this. Okay, the purple or magenta line. It looks kind of white on the video screen here. I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but it's supposed to be purple. That is the negative rail. And you notice it's doing the opposite because, of course, it's charging up more negative and then discharging this way. You notice it's not quite lined up. If I turn off channel 1, you can see this. Of course, I'm triggering on channel 1, so it's moving now, but let me turn channel 1 back on. You see they don't overlap. The charging and discharging portions of the waveform don't overlap. That's because, again, being half wave, and the positive side is charging here, and then the waveform goes negative and turns the diode on on the negative side and charges that capacitor. Normally with a full wave bridge, your uh, two rails would rise and fall equally. But because these have charging and discharging out of phase with each other, the rails are going to kind of wobble like this. Another thing to note is, you know, these are, you can see the, uh, the shape of this has some pretty sharp edges. So there's a pretty good amount of harmonics in there. Of course, having uh, high harmonics in your power supply is not good because it might be more audible. So, uh, yeah, we'll listen to it and see what it sounds like. Okay, so now I hooked up the chip to the power supply. These are the 1K load resistors. I have the positive one off right now. Let me get you back at the scope here. And the light off. So this is the waveform with the load coming from the chip. So it's not as much, but let me uh, reconnect that load resistor. So during this test, I'm going to make it more challenging and have the load resistor connected. So we got one hell of a ripple. You now three volts peak to peak. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is connect the preamp to the computer and I found some music in the YouTube library that's safe to play without getting tagged and I'll do one recording with the terrible supply as I'll call it and another with a supply using batteries which would be more of an ideal supply because there'll be no way for any electrical noise to leak in I mean, it still could get in because this is not an ideal circuit layout by far. But, you know, there's one less means for electrical noise to get in. Plus, it won't have that awful ripple amount. So, with those two samples, and I won't tell you which one they are, just listen to them and see, well, do they really sound any different from each other?
Okay, so after listening to those samples, can you really tell which is which? Does it really make the music sound that much different? You know, the point I'm trying to make is this really there isn't that much difference. Sure, if you cranked up that silent section and listened to the noise, you could hear the hum coming through a little bit from the you know, the poor supply setup versus the batteries. You know, this circuit the gain is a bit high. I'm not using the latest high performance chip. Layout on a socket board is not that great. I mean, not that well insulated. But still, there's not a huge difference. So would I use something this bad if I made an op amp power supply? Absolutely not. Yeah, I would use a much better design supply. Yeah, I would set the gain as minimal as I would need for the circuit to keep noise levels down. And I would probably select a higher end or a, uh, a newer, higher performance op amp, depending, you know, if money factored into the situation. And that's another thing. Those higher performance chips do cost more than your uh, Jelly Bean Any 5532, so that comes in. But if it were me, I would certainly choose a newer, high-performance op-amp. Okay, so what I'll do now is get back on the scope and look at improving the supply. I'll do it in little steps here so you can see how it improves as I add components to this. And I'll have a decent supply in the end, but I will caution you, I'm not trying to build in a super high-end audio foo-foo type supply. Yeah, you know, just something that will work better. Okay, so I unhitched the preamp. So now it's just the supply with the one kilo ohm loads. And we're back to our two volt peak to peak ripple. Very excessive. Remember we had even more than that with the load of the preamp when I was doing that music sample. So it does show how global negative feedback really removes that. It's called SVR, or Supply Voltage Rejection. It's how the amplifier can ignore or reject noise from the supply, and it does pretty well. And again, this has pretty sharp edges, so there are pretty high harmonics that could get into the amplifier. And in that sample, yeah, if you did turn up the volume and listen to the quiet part, you would hear a little bit of hum in the output there. But it, you know, it's almost down into the noise floor. Well, I'm using only 100 microfarad capacitors, which on this half-wave supply and even on a full-wave supply are really incapable of getting rid of the uh, ripple. Okay, so I'm going to jump up a little bit to 220 microfarads. Most people would say that's still not enough, and I would tend to agree but we'll try it anyway because actually that it's really the only capacitors that I have enough of to play with in this example but anyway let's hook these up to both rails of course the positives already installed and you're seeing the results and it cuts it about in half exactly what you would expect no surprises there Okay, well, that's still not good enough, so let's add yet another one in parallel. So that would double the capacitance to 440 microfarads. And should cut that in half yet again. Let's turn that up. Yeah, we're down to, what is that, four? About 450. Any audio engineer would still say, that's still pretty significant. Can we do anything else? I mean, we're getting these really sharp edges here, and that's going to create harmonics. What can we do about that? Okay, so there's another thing we can do. And, well, I had those two capacitors in parallel, but I can add a resistance between those. What that does is make this a low pass filter so now you have the resistance element and the capacitor so this forms a low pass filter so let's see what that does 
I'll pop in the capacitor there. And yeah, it did a little bit. It got rid of that sharp peak. It lowered the voltage a little bit. However, it's really not that good because the resistor I chose is 10 ohms. You want to choose a value that's not going to cause you too much voltage drop. I didn't want to really lose more than about a volt with a 100 milliamp capable supply. So, you know, that's a volt there. So that's why I chose 10 ohms. But 10 ohms with the 220 microfarad capacitor, the pole frequency is above our ripple frequency. And that's, you know, that's not effective enough. And <laughs> I got a cat. No, it's not going to work, Snickers. I got a piece of cardboard sitting there so I don't get a lot of glare from the light. And he wants to look outside. So if we increase the capacitor on the filter there to 1000 microfarads, I'd make the pole frequency at 15 hertz. And look at that, much better. You can see it, it got rid of those you know, fast changing angle there, which would be a lot of harmonics. And we're getting down to close to 100 millivolts, which I would like to see. Okay, so I did one better. I changed the capacitor here to 1000 microfarads as well. So all the capacitors are 1000 microfarads and the uh, 10 ohm resistor. So let's turn this up a little bit so you can see it. A little more. So we, we really knocked down that ripple. We got rid of some of that high frequency harmonic content. Much better supply. Now I know a lot of you are now screaming or shaking your heads and saying, John Audio Tech, why don't you just use a voltage regulator? Well, yeah, those are good. They're going to get rid of your ripple, that's for sure. That would relax your requirements for capacitors. However, I still think feeding the voltage regulator a signal that doesn't have those high uh, harmonics in the signal, you know, using that pi network as they often call it, you know, the resistor and capacitor filter there, would greatly help the regulator out, giving it a very clean supply. Another reason for having a regulator is, well, if you're running the op amp with a plus minus 15 volt supply, you're running it at pretty close to its absolute maximum rating, which could be plus minus 17 or 18 volts or so. And if your uh, mains voltage is not that stable, it's possible you can exceed the supply voltage of the op amp without using the regulator. So that's a consideration as well. Another thing is if you're using the op amp for line level voltages, which are pretty low voltages, you know, shouldn't need any more than two volts peak, you don't have to run the op amp at such high rail voltages. Okay, I changed this yet again. So now I went 470 right here and 330s on this side of the resistor. I only did that because I didn't have any more 470s, but I would rather use 470s here. But you can see our ripple has increased to around 180 millivolts. So now I'll add a regulator to take care of the rest of that ripple. Okay, so here's the final design with the regulators added. Just using the 78 and 79 series so now there's no ripple whatsoever you can turn that up you might see something slight going on there in the noise but it pretty much destroys all the ripple yeah it's far better than you would ever need giving the little experiment before here's the actual circuit let me talk about the schematic a little bit Okay, so some closing comments on the design of this op amp regulator. This is 100 milliamps. You might need a little more or a little less for your circuit. This is not for powering power amps. You know, this is just for 
op amps that don't need a lot of current. I know some people say, oh, can I use this for a power amp? No, <laughs> not with a half wave design. So for a transformer, I would select one that's about 5 volts higher than your desired output voltage and 500 milliamps secondary. That way as you load down the output, the ripple voltage doesn't impinge on the dropout voltage of the regulator. The dropout voltage means that the regulator has to have a certain amount of input voltage higher than its output. And with the 78 and 79 series, it's about 2 volts. So let's say you're using a 12 volt regulator here. So the lowest voltage, the lowest peaks of that ripple cannot go below 14 volts. And of course on the negative side, the highest voltage peaks can't go within negative 14 volts. So when you're finalizing the design of your regulator, make sure you test it under full load to make sure that the ripple is not falling within its dropout voltage and causing little pulses on the output. These diodes here are to protect the regulator. If for some reason the output becomes higher than the input voltage, for example, if somehow the input became shorted, a voltage can flow backwards through the regulator, which could damage it. So shunting that with the diodes would protect the regulators. But that's a situation that's not likely to happen, so these are not required. Though it's good practice to have them. I mean, how much does a diode cost? Last but not least, what voltage should you have for your op amp? Well, back in the early days, op amps needed higher voltage to perform properly. So you saw a lot of circuits that had plus and minus 15, plus and minus 12. But modern high performance op amps, they don't need a high voltage. So the supply voltage you would need, you would just have to make sure you get the maximum output swing without clipping. So with line level circuits, you're not going to go above 2 volts peak. So you could get away with a 5 volt and a negative 5 volt regulator. But only if you're using a high performance modern op amp where it specifies on the data sheet that it can operate at very low voltages. Some of the op amps, they can run down under plus or minus 2 volts. But I would still give it some headroom because, you know, with line level, you might need a little bit more signal than that. Well, that's going to do it for this one. Thanks for watching.